when you entrust a man with a public trust and you know that he's human and you don't want him to run amok, you bind him down with an oath. I know we heard talk today about someday you may see those in the uniform in violation of their oaths pointing the gun at you, their masters, in an unlawful way. I pray that never happens. It has happened. I want to assure you, the man in the uniform will not be I. Law enforcement and military are not the enemy. There's a lot of people that think, oh God, we're going to have to fight the U.S. forces. We're going to have to fight the Marines. We're going to have to fight the Army. And that's not, not the case. The U.S. military is not against the people. We are the people. Today, really, in many respects, our government is the one that is stepping aside the rule of law. Gun confiscation is exactly what happened during the state of emergency following Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. The social controllers are very scared of police and military rediscovering their oath of office. I will not obey orders to impose martial law. I will not obey. They understand that throughout history, tyranny comes to your door in a uniform. We will not obey orders to conduct warrantless searches of the American people. I will not obey. Think of every instance you can think in history where republics have fallen through usurpation of power. Particularly think of the times when it has happened through the military force run amok. You can't really tell from my name, but my father uh, lived, uh, lived under Stalin and his whole family was killed by Stalin. And my mother's a family escaped from uh, North Korea and they lost all their property and were supposed to be killed at least three or four times. So I was fortunate to be uh, born in this great nation, and, uh, but yet I see the same uh, signs or our country going in uh, the direction in which my parents escaped from. U.S. troops also arrived, something far easier to do even now thanks to last year's elimination of the 1878 Posse Comitatus Act. That forbid U.S. troops from policing on American soil. We will not obey any orders force American citizens into any form of detention camps under any pretext. I will not obey. To what degree are we anymore uh, mindful of oaths? If we had law enforcement in America keeping their oath to do just that, we would have our constitutional republic back tomorrow. That's how powerful this movement is. I'm Garrett Lear, the Patriot Pastor. This is where the battle was fought, right here in the Lexington Battle Green. This is sacred ground. This is one of the most important pieces of real estate in the history of America. This is where it happened. And this was the shot basically heard around the world and still being heard around the world, I think. I grew up in the town of Lexington, standing on the green, playing on the green, when I was a boy growing up, my mother told me about our ancestry. And so I started to go on the village green in Lexington, but didn't pay a whole lot of attention except to the statue of John Parker. Everyone could look up to him because he wasn't white, he wasn't brown, he wasn't red, he wasn't yellow, he wasn't black. He's green, actually. <laughs> so anyone could identify with him. And I said, one day when I grow up, I want to be like him. Welcome to Lexington, the cradle of American liberty. Most people don't know really what happened at the Battle of Lexington, but basically what happened was the night before the battle, that would have been April 18th, riders came in, you know, that's the midnight ride of Paul Revere. It was actually John Dawes that did it and a man named Prescott, because Paul Revere was interdicted by the British troops. But they were bringing a message from Dr. Warren and the committees of correspondence and the committees of safety in Boston to tell them looks like the British uh, are mounted troops here and uh, we're not exactly sure what they're trying to do. They're probably going to go after the munitions that are in Concord, but they're probably going to try to capture Samuel Adams and John Hancock and either send them back to England in chains or shoot them right there or something. And basically when the British came, it was obvious that they had some bad plan. The Minutemen, the militia, the regulated militia, did not want to engage the British troops in a fight. And so these men stood their ground when they were told, you are to drop your weapons and disband. Well, they started to disband, but they would not drop their weapons because they were militia. And what happened when they started to disband, they got fired on. The first shot that was fired was fired by the British regulars. It was not fired by the Minutemen. It was not fired by the colonists. It was not fired by the people of Lexington. 
and we can find that in the uh, narrative of, of Jonas Clark, the pastor. Eight of them got shot and killed. Many were bayoneted. Some died later of wounds. Many were wounded. But eight died on this green. But they stopped the British as they were on their march to conquer. And they did what was right. This was a principled stand for freedom, and we're doing the same thing today. We will not obey orders to disarm the American people. I will not obey. Well, today we're here on the green at Lexington, April 19th, which is the anniversary of April 19th, 1775, which was the first shot and fire of the American Revolution. I'm Stuart Rhodes, the founder of Oath Keepers, and, which is a nonpartisan association of current serving military, uh, police, and veterans, all of us who swore an oath to defend the Constitution. And our mission is to make sure that all of the other oath takers are oath keepers. Gun confiscation is exactly what happened during the state of emergency following Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. U.S. troops also arrived, something far easier to do even now thanks to last year's elimination of the 1878 Posse Comitatus Act. That forbid U.S. troops from policing on American soil. We've had critics say, well, what are you guys talking about? Of course I'm going to keep my oath. I find it offensive that you even suggest that a, a military officer or a police officer would not keep the oath. And we say, hey, we got one word for you, Katrina. Okay? Look at what happened there. And so we want to make sure there are no more Katrinas. We don't want any more of that. What we're hearing is that a lot of those guys just weren't prepared for those orders and hadn't thought about it ahead of time. Then we have Lieutenant Commander Cunningham. Uh, Guy Cunningham, who was the author of the 29 Palms survey that was done back in 1995, where well, sur he surveyed the Marine Corps, the Marines of 29 Palms, and asked them whether or not they would fire on Americans who resisted in an attempt to disarm them. If orders came down to disarm the American people and they resisted, would they fire on them? So his The 29 Palms survey, ending with question 46, with the scenario that the government has banned all non-sporting firearms and that the American citizens in possession of these firearms have 30 days to turn them over to the local authorities. At the end of this period of time, several citizen groups form that refuse or resist the confiscation of these firearms banned by the U.S. government. Marines were asked whether or not they would fire upon U.S. citizens who refuse or resist the confiscation of firearms banned by the U.S. government. And I found this very difficult to swallow. 11% opted with the no opinion response. Had no opinion firing on their own fellow Americans? Of the remaining 26 point three four percent answered that they would fire on their fellow Americans, U.S. citizens, who refused or resisted the confiscation of firearms banned by the U.S. government, who had no authority constitutionally to enact such a ban. My name is Sergeant Charles Dyer. Uh, I'm an Oath Keeper. I'm with 1st Light Armored Reconnaissance Battalion out of uh, Camp Pendleton, California. I absolutely could not, I, I can't imagine that we're living in the times where I have to worry about having to confiscate the weapons from the American people. Is that freedom? It's absolutely not freedom. Uh, that I have to worry that we're going to quarantine a, a, a city for uh, the purposes of, of, of keeping them in their hostage, like Katrina? Absolutely not. That's not freedom in any way that you can think of it. That I'm almost speechless whenever I try to talk about this because I, I can't imagine that we're living in this kind of time. It, it really bothers me. Absolutely. Because of the quotation uh, March 11th, 1993 by President Clinton because of the Clinton assault weapons ban that was being enacted I formed a scenario that I knew would be explosive shouldn't have been but because of the times and the machinations of certain forces to disarm the American people 
I don't care whether it's your governor or your senator or your representative or your or president. I'm sure you can look at instances, days within having sworn his oath, the person violates it blatantly. That's a dangerous thing. I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. None of this stuff would be happening if it is stuck with the Constitution and stuck within its parameters.